Books and Books is very pleased to have with us tonight Rabbi Mordecai Schreiber and Why People Pray. Born and raised in Israel, Rabbi Schreiber spent six years in Latin America and is equally at home speaking Hebrew, Spanish, or English. He served congregations in the United States and Central America and has worked as an editor, translator, publisher, with over 50 books authored under his name and under the pen name Maury Sofer. Rabbi, author, educator, writer, translator, biblical scholar, and founder of the Schreiber Translations, Schreiber's latest transformation is Cruise Rabbi. In the past 10 years, he has sailed the seven seas as a spiritual leader on board cruise ships. We're so glad to have us with him on dry land. Please give him a nice warm welcome, Mr. Morday, Rabbi Schreiber. Sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, my voice carries, but I'll speak to the mic. Uh, huh, yeah. Anyway, um, the book we're here to hear about uh, is called Why People Pray. A very simple, innocent question. Why not? You know? And uh, whoever questions, you pray, you know, people pray, some people don't pray. It seems to be all straightforward. But that's very misleading. That's very. A uh, simplistic way of looking at it because prayer is probably one of the most misunderstood human activities I can think of um, it happens on many different levels and many different ways and yet as you heard I have traveled all over the planet and been almost everywhere and I learned a few things that most people never never learn never have the opportunity to to learn because you have to go and see it for yourself. First of all, everywhere I've been traveling from Latin America to the Far East and uh, from Northern Europe to Africa, I always run into people praying, either alone or in small groups or in very large groups. I was just in China, a very big island off the coast of China, not far from Shanghai which is famous for its Buddhist shrines, and you see thousands and thousands of young Chinese in People's Republic, supposedly so-called communist China, if you will, uh, streaming to, to this island, filling up these uh, temples, uh, prostrating themselves in deep in prayer, burning incense, and so on. About a year and a half ago, I went on a river cruise in a country called Myanmar, which used to be Burma. The entire country praying constantly. This was a time when the lady, the lady is the, the woman who finally got elected there to so many years of ruthless dictatorship. And they were all praying, all the way from uh, Mandalay in the north, I think, to Yangon, which used to be Rangoon in the south. An, an amazing spectacle. So I ask myself why? Why are people into an, an activity which you talk to someone, but the other, the other party doesn't talk to you? Unless if God talks to you, God bless you, tell me about it. Because I've had a long relationship with God, but uh, I pick up the phone, you know, I talk to myself, basically. And I say, you know, they pray. Go to pray. They're invoking the divinity and they keep doing it for, for a lifetime and then their children and children's children and there's a mystery here that nobody has been able to uh, uh, figure out but that being said 
from all of my study of religions and all the books that I read, it was really my life experience, my, my first-hand travels that brought me to writing this book. Not my study so much, because this human contact made me realize that in all of us, and that doesn't only apply to people who call themselves religious or observant, it applies to everyone. Because prayer, and that's the first big insight I wanted to share with you, is not only the formal activity of opening a prayer book and reading or intoning or reciting a prayer, which, which is the formal way of doing it. Prayer, on an individual basis, can manifest itself in so many ways. One of the examples that I bring out in the book, which always made an impression on me, there were two very famous artists, painters in Europe in the 19th century. You all heard of them, Van Gogh and Gauguin. They even lived together for a few years in northern France and always fought with each other. They were two very, very difficult people, very difficult. They were not saints, that's for sure. But the interesting thing about Van Gogh and Gauguin is that Van Gogh, in his youth, wanted to be a, um, a, a pastor. He, he, wanted, he started to study religion. He, he was a very religious person. Didn't work for him. And so art, art became his way of expressing his religious feelings. We don't talk that much about it. No, everybody knows Van Gogh. But the Van Gogh was motivated by a religious fervor. It's something that I don't see written in too many places, but, but that's a fact. Gauguin even more so. If you know the work of Gauguin, he portrayed himself in many uh, paintings as Jesus Christ. He used himself as a model. He, he was very imbued with his uh, religious faith. And he too, he too, if you carefully study his paintings. But going back to, to, to uh, Van Gogh, his famous painting, The Sower, for example. Very religious painting. Almost the, the sun is setting like a, what do you call it, a halo over the, the sower's head. And then if you look at Gauguin and, and you see what he's looking for, answers to the mystery of life, the big canvas, where, where do we come from, where are we going, etc. They're all religious paintings. And what it made me realize is you can pray through painting. You can pray through gardening. You can pray in so many different ways. And, it, and, and, and it's just as real and sincere and spiritual as going to a house of worship. The other thing that I learned from my travels and from observing all the different religions in the world is that we all have this idea that Buddhism and Islam and, and uh, Judaism and Christianity, and etc., are all very different from each other. And that is not true. They're all very, very, very similar. They're all basically doing the same thing. The, the exterior is different. The symbols are different. But the core ideas are the same. What is the most important prayer in Christianity? Anybody knows? I'm, I'm, I don't want to conduct the class. Yeah? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be done. That's the core. That's the only prayer to my knowledge in the New Testament that Jesus himself taught his disciples. So he takes on a authority higher than all the other prayers in the Christian canon. What is the prayer Jews say the most? No, they say the Shema a couple times a day, but there's another prayer that they use as the Kaddish. Excellent. The Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish, the learner's Kaddish, the many different kinds of Kaddish. The Kaddish is the uh, predecessor of the Lord's Prayer. If, if you compare uh, ho, uh, magnifying hallowed be thy name, the way the Kaddish starts, hallowed be thy name, it's really basically the same prayer. So here you have two major religions, 
living side by side here in America and Europe and so on for, for centuries. And, and their, their main prayer is basically the same. And then there is this book that has given the world more prayers than any book ever written. Anybody would like to offer which, which book? But most of the Bible is a collection of books. But there's, huh? Bhava Gita, no. The Psalms. The book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. No, the book of Psalms. In, 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 yeah, because if you go to any Christian service of any denomination, and you go to any Jewish service, invariably there will be at least two or more Psalms in any particular service at any particular time. If you take out the Psalms, from the Christian liturgy and the Jewish liturgy, you take out the, the soul, so to speak, the essence of the service. So here's a book that's shared by Jews and Christians and is very critical to both religions to express, for example, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my share, but I shall not want, etc. Always recited at Jewish funerals, recited in, on, also in life occasions by Christians, a very critical uh, prayer shared by the two religions. So in this book, I try to uh, explore how, what happens when, when we pray on our own, to ourselves. And, and that is a very important area of prayer. What happens when we pray in a group, in a, in, in a communal situation? Well, that happens on holidays, on, on Sundays for Christians, on, on, on a Saturday, Friday night for, for Jews, Friday for Muslims, and, and so on and so forth. It, our lives have a, are framed in a cycle of prayers. Life, life events, uh, birth baby naming, uh, for Jews, bar mitzvah, confirmation, for both, uh, weddings for everybody, funerals. All of these things are sanctified by prayers. Without them, it would be very strange. You know, you, a wedding would become the cocktail party, a funeral would become just a sad occasion. Uh, just today, we observed the memorial service in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, President Obama, former President Bush, uh, talked, and it was there the, were the, the clergy, including a rabbi, and a wonderful, fantastic choir, uh, blacks and whites, and it was a very moving service, very moving occasion, showing America trying to come together through prayer. So now, the, the other in, insight that I would like to share with you, that I learned from all of this vast exposure that I've had, which is almost very unusual, you know, very rare, is that there is a need in the world. There's a need to find some common denominators, some common ground for all the religions of the world to come together, not, not, not to give up anybody's religion. Everybody's tradition is important and valid. And by the way, there are things in Islam that are more beautiful, I think, than in other religions. There are things in Christianity, there are things in Judaism, in Buddhism. The, 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 or, the uh, or, um, Eastern religions have this tremendous compassion for animals, for everything, every living thing, plants, animal, the planet. In that area, they are years ahead of, of the West, because we, we look now at the planet, we see how much damage has been done to our planet. And, and, and when you look at, at their um, liturgies, you find wonderful prayers, asking forgiveness of ants and, and grasses for walking on them, things that never occurred to us. But it's so gentle, it's so sweet. I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to bring out is, is we can all learn from each other so much. And yet, unfortunately, Religion, more often than not, has, and, and, and prayer and liturgy have been used as a div divide, as a way to separate people. You know, this is my place, your place, and I do it this way, you do it that way. It's all good and well, 
if in addition to all of this, we started to realize that as the world is becoming smaller and smaller, and by the way, having gone around the world a couple of times, let me tell you, you keep going back to the same places. The world is not, it's not that big. It's not. You know, I've been to Dubai three times the last five years. It's enough already, you know. Who wants to go to Dubai? You know, it's enough. It's beautiful, you know. The dancing fountains and the tallest building in the world. And the, they got so much money there, you know. They can buy anything they want. I went to the hospital there. It was one of the best hospitals in the world. Great. But so what? You see, so it, it, it's a small planet. And it's become a global village. And we're all in it together. And I don't know who's more capitalistic, the U.S. or communist China. It's, I went to a city near Shanghai. There were more Maseratis and Ferraris and, and you know, Lamborghinis than, than in all of the United States, just in one part of China. And these are all, of course, members of the Communist Party. Um, so, uh, you know, it's that kind of a world. Uh, everybody sells everything wherever they can. You know, you publish a book in America, next thing you see, it's in Korea, it's, it's in Japan, it's, it's God knows where, you know. I, I go on Google, I see my book in places, in, in languages that I don't know, how, how did they get there so fast, you know, to the Netherlands and uh, Finland and I don't know what else. So, this is the kind of a world we live in. I don't know how long I've been talking, I think my, my time is up. And I, <laughs> I have so much to say, I can talk for another hour, but I won't. And I think I was told that I now have to uh, open for some questions, so I am, please, shoot away. Whatever you want to ask is fine. No bars held. Oh, sorry. I have a chicken and the egg yeah. question. Mm -hmm. People historically in different parts of the world, I think we pretty much assume we never had any contact with each other. All developed apparently similar belief systems that, that were based on a deity, sometimes um, multiple deities. Um, is this proof of the existence of the deity, or is this proof of the need of the human being to pray? It's, to de it's, definitely, it's definitely a proof of the human need to pray. Proof of the deity is beyond our understanding. That if anybody who says, yeah, I know for a fact, you know, God exists. Yeah, show it to me, prove it to me, etc. That gets a little bit difficult. But that there is a common human need, for sure. For example, one thing I learned at some point, I lived in a country called Guatemala. And I learned that the Guatemalan Mayan Indians have their own scripture about the creation of the world. I think it's called the Popol Vuh. Yeah. Yeah. Popol Vuh, right? Yeah, I'm right. It's fascinating. It's very similar to the story in, in, in Genesis. And how did people in, in the mountains of Guatemala and in the desert of uh, the Middle East come up with such similar thing? And not only, and it's all over the world. I'm just taking one example. So that there is such commonality in the world among human beings that we're all so closely related to each other. That is a given. And the more you see, the more real it becomes. But whether it's proof because of all of this that there is, that becomes a very personal thing. To me, I, w I was born... What time is up? No, no, no. Oh, the mic, I'm sorry. The mic. I don't like mics, but okay. I like men whose name is Mike, but... You know, Mike is the most common male name in America. Um, All people have so much in common. That it's a shame that there's so much of this misunderstanding and hatred and, and you know, animosity and misunderstanding. It's mostly because people don't know. Most people in this world didn't have the great good fortune I had of hopping on a fancy ship and running all over the, this little planet. You know, because when you do, you realize and you learn. So that, that it is what it is. Another question. Mr. Sussman, will you give up your question? Well, oh. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just go ahead. Okay, all right. So I, I work in the spectrum of Judaism, and I dive into the place. Yeah. But if, if you look at a, 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 in a conservative framework, 
Okay, all I can say about you, you are quoting from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Huh? Nehemiah. Nehemiah, okay. That's a later book, but it doesn't matter. The Bible, the uh, Hebrew Bible, is a brutally honest book. It tells you what was happening year, centuries, millennia ago. That's what was happening. It was a human existence was dog eat dog. I had to kill you, you had to kill me. That was the reality of human life on this planet for a very long time. And in some respect, you see, here we are, 21st century America. Every day we have killings in this country. Insane. The most advanced country in the world. The country which should be the most peaceful, the most ecumenical, the most understanding. And look what's happening. We're afraid to turn on the news these days. Because every day there's a major tragedy. And, and this is nothing compared to how it used to be. For example, there's an interesting expression in the Old Testament. Springtime is, is, called, is, is called in one place as the time when the kings go out. Why? What does it mean the kings are going out? They're going out to start a war. The weather is nice. They have nothing better to do. They start a war. We're not so different. We, we, we Americans and others... But starting plenty of wars, unnecessary wars, stupid wars. You know, wars that we, we pay dearly for, and it's not over yet. And um, it was so institutionalized that springtime meant the time to go to war. That's kind of scary, but that, 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 that is, that's what it was. That's how it was. And yes, you're right, that's where everything started. But you like to think that there's a thing called human progress. That we learn something from, from the past. That we become better. You know, like uh, the president was quoting uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln the other night. says, we listen to the a angels of our be better nature. I think this was Lincoln's expression. So, you know, we, we all want to do it. All normal people want to be better people. And yet it is so difficult to do. So difficult. Ask him. Yeah. The, um, I suppose back in the day when I was learning how to read literature at the Columbia, uh, so my professors told us, gave us a way of looking at things. You look at the first paragraph and you look at the last paragraph. And so I did it with your book, of course. As you know, I read the whole book. And um, I was intrigued, of course, that you chose to conclude with the Baha'i religion. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you'd like to comment more about that, because, right. uh, be, because this particular book, and you know I've read some of your other books, yeah. this is very much in the first person, and it's a journey. And, and you conclude with Baha'i. So would you like to comment? Well, let me explain. First of all, I was born across the street from the world center of the Baha'i in Haifa, Israel. Everybody knows this. Beautiful, gorgeous temple with a golden dome and a fantastic gardens from Mount Carmel down to the Haifa Bay. And I, from a very young age, I was intrigued with these people, and I tried to learn a little bit about them. The Baha'i is not another religion, another faith system like the rest of us, because their founder, the Baha'u'llah in the 19th century, they're, they're less than 200 years old. Um, he had this revelation, he tells us, that all the great prophets of history, from the Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, etc., are all messengers in a chain of tradition, of continuous revelation, that come, appear for the human race at certain points to bring the knowledge of God to the world, etc. So I had the, the, the good fortune, I moved to Fort Lauderdale, there's a nice Baha'i community there. It meets in a beautiful house, but 
beautiful Baha'i couple. And Baha'i is, is not, a big, not a big movement. There may be a few millions in the world. Um, but I learned that these people, first of all, they attract everybody. Races, religions, it doesn't matter. You have 100 people in, in a room there when, when they meet. There's a cross-section of the whole human race. And they don't push anything. And they don't convert. They don't doctrine. Their aim is to bring the human race together. They're very active in UN agencies, by the way. Very active. And I thought that there would be a good way to conclude my own experience. Because let's face it. We Jews, you Christians, them Muslims, we're all sectarian. We're all triumphalist. We all have a checkered history. All of us. Ah, we Jews like to play the role of the victims because <laughs> there's hundreds of millions of Christians and hundreds of millions of Muslims. We're a small people, so we're always the victim. Well, you know, a victim can also make trouble. <laughs> you know? A victim is not a saint, necessarily. Just because, because somebody in Uruguay, when I lived there in my teens, the owner of a big bookstore in Montevideo said to me, the only reason you didn't go around killing people like the Crusades and the Muslims because you didn't have the numbers. You couldn't do it. If you were numerous like us, you would do the same thing. It was a very cynical remark, and I was very upset. I was very young and very indignant. He was 100% right. <laughs> he was right. We're no, we're no better than anybody else. You know? So we're all in it together. And that's the first thing that we all need to admit to ourselves and not put ourselves on a pedestal and not pretend I'm, I'm better than thou. I think I have spoken enough, and unless there are more questions, uh, I guess, uh, is there anything else that we want to discuss? We'll meet you here next oh, week, same time. Here. Same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Jacobstein. Oh, you, you mean the story of Cain and Abel, kind of sacrifice. Pagan. Right, that's the first time that prayer is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, in, this, in this ancient times, they bring sacrifices as a form of worship, and they want God to listen to them and bless them, etc., etc. And the, and the end result is fratricide, is that the word? Brother killing brother, and that's how the human race starts. It's glorious history. That's how it starts. From day one. I want to say something. Yep. My name's Peter. I um, got a letter, an email from this guy a year ago telling me he was uh, moving to Fort Lauderdale and he wanted to write a book called Why People Pray. And uh, I'm very proud that we got it published. Maury not only became my client, but he became my friend. And um, he wrote this book came into my life at a very important time, I really didn't pray a lot, and I w wound up praying almost every day, not necessarily a religious prayer, but a prayer for peace, and, and uh, I, I call it, uh, I have a, my iCloud, which is my cloud, where I pray for other people's suffering, and that people be relieved from pain and suffering, so I want to thank you for writing your book. My pleasure. My pleasure. Folks, don't forget the book is for sale behind the counter. You're watching online. Give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you, as I said earlier, uh, right over there. Uh, the good rabbi will be sitting right there signing for you as soon as you buy your book. Limit to five only, please. No, they're right out there at the counter. That was a wonderful presentation. Can we get another round of applause for Rabbi Mordechai, please? Thank you all for coming. Good night.